Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me one of my favorite guests, William Engdahl. And uh, William is an award-winning geopolitical analyst. He's been on this show many times before. He's written a number of books, some very, very important books, uh, having to do with geopolitical issues and, and economics that result from uh, those those forces in play. Uh, and uh, his books have been translated into 14 different languages. He is recognized perhaps more overseas than in America, but uh, I want to do my part to get him recognized in the United States as well as, as much as possible, because much of what he has to say, I think, uh, ha- uh, much of what he has to say, I think, is very important for Americans to know, because they don't hear it here. There is definitely a, a propaganda game going on everywhere in the world, of course, but not the least of which is the United States. You know, when I was a kid during the Cold War, I knew that the Russians were liars and we were nothing but truth tellers, or so I thought. And I suspect that it, most Americans feel that way today. Most Americans feel, still feel that what they see on television is really true. Um, and so they, they believe it. And nobody's thinking very much for themselves. They're all thinking alike. And somebody said, if everybody's thinking alike, then nobody is thinking. Well, William Engdell is here to help us think today, to challenge our conventional wisdom. Thanks again for joining me today, William. Jay, it's very good to be with you again. Always good to have you. Uh, always interesting. Your website is, is really a pleasure to uh, to go to. Uh, always provocative things there. Uh, I guess we're looking at WilliamAngdahl.com. That's E-N-G-D-A-H-L. E-N-G-D-A-H-L. The spelling, which I always have a lot of trouble with. Uh, my wife straightens me out on that. But anyway, I want to talk to you today about <laughs> Manifest Destiny. Uh, the subtitle is Democracy as Cognitive Dissidence. Uh, your latest efforts on that, uh, your latest book that you've written and just has just gone to press recently, I believe. Uh, cognitive dissidence yep. uh, is the state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude changes. I might say instead of inconsistent, sometimes outright contradictory thoughts and beliefs. So, yes. Uh, yes. Now, uh, William, can you give us some some examples as to how the United States and NATO have used the theme of democracy, for example, uh, to appear to take the high road, but then in fact have acted uh, in an opposite fashion that is inconsistent with the principles of democracy? Yeah. What I do, I, I quote directly from the famous George Orwell book of 1984, uh, where he talks about cognitive dissonance, Big Brother, and, and whatnot, that uh, freedom is slavery, war is peace, uh, love is hate, and, and so forth. And the cognitive dissonance that I describe in the book goes back to the creation of something very few Americans are aware of. Back during the Reagan administration, CIA Chief Bill Casey convinced President Reagan to create apparently private non-governmental organizations, NGOs, that would be, in fact, conduits to do what the CIA was doing in terms of toppling unfriendly regimes in Iran or in Guatemala or in Chile and so forth, but without the danger that the CIA would be caught with their hands on the trigger. So they created a series of NGOs, most importantly, the National Endowment for Democracy. It sounds very, very philanthropic even. Yes. You know, the National Mm -hmm. Endowment for the Arts and, and so forth. And that was deliberately done, you know, this kind of linguistic manipulation that the CIA is is, uh, so good at. And they get government money, but they appear to be a private, uh, you know, do-gooder NGO. And they support so-called human rights and so-called democracy, I call it fake democracy, movements that are aimed, for example, their first project was to bring down the communist regime in Poland. Well, most Americans will say, well and good, that's, that's wonderful. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but what they brought in was George Soros. They brought in economic shock therapy. They brought in mass unemployment, whereas before, at least under communism, everyone had a, a job. You had daycare, uh, health care uh, provided by the state, and so forth. And all of that was gone overnight. Inflation soared through the roof, hyperinflation. Mm-hmm. And this was Jeffrey Sachs and a bunch of Harvard economists and so forth creating shock therapy and 
George Soros and, and friends came in and, and used dollars to buy up all the crown jewels of the Polish economy at pennies on the dollar. Then they took that to Russia, and the same NGOs, the National Endowment for Democracy, Freedom House, Soros Open Society Foundation, and so forth, they worked with Yeltsin to create this... Uh, this fake democracy that Boris Yeltsin did more to destroy Russian society and culture and uh, standard of living than 70 years of communism, I would say, did before that. And he did it in cooperation with the American or the Western NGOs and with the CIA. He literally, the top generals around uh, the KGB sold themselves out to the CIA in return for billions of dollars. That's the origin, by the way, of the Russian oligarchs. It's not Russian organized crime. It's CIA organized crime with Russian uh, players. So Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the the great uh, victim of imprisonment by Putin, he's a crook. He's a manifest crook who tried to double-cross everybody. And he was part of this circle of oligarchs that was created by George Bush Sr. and the Reagan administration and the CIA and later the Clinton administration. So then uh, the book traces this whole development, the refining of the techniques, the using of Twitter, Facebook, and so forth, uh, the uh, uh, swarming techniques that the Rand Corporation developed for having mob demonstrations in Tahrir Square in Egypt against Mubarak or in, in uh, uh, Kiev in Ukraine in, in 2013-2014 to create the coup d'etat there. And uh, that was anything but a democratic revolution, but U.S. State Department called it that. Mm-hmm. So the examples are, are many, and they're still going on today. There was just one yesterday in Armenia. The prime minister, who uh, is Armenia, is part of the Russian uh, Eurasian Economic Union. It's just, it works very closely with Russia. It's like, uh, you know, the European Union, but but with Russia and Kazakhstan and uh, Belarus and so forth. And now they have an anti-Russian prime minister because George Soros and the U.S. NGOs created this, uh, you know, these mass protests and caught them off guard and, and uh, forced the prime minister to step down. So this mm-hmm. this is ongoing. It's ongoing in Syria. It's, it was ongoing in uh, Egypt, as I mentioned before, against Mubarak and uh, in Libya to an extent, although there it was done militarily because Gaddafi, as you know, Jay, was about to create a gold-backed dinar and demand gold for sale of Libyan oil on, on the world market. That's that correct, and I think he had actually set up a pan-African uh, trading system, uh, uh, trading a group of countries that would trade based on gold with a gold-backed currency that that he was behind. Correct. That's my understanding. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's precisely what was. And had that really uh, taken wing the French influence over colonial influence over Africa through its currencies uh, uh, would be gone overnight. Uh, the uh, The whole global financial system that's based on the dollar uh, and fiat currency would, would be threatened by that. So mm-hmm. Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, ordered ordered Gaddafi to be taken down. That's as simple as it is. Right. So, you know, just backing up a little bit with what you mentioned, uh, Casey and, uh, you know, the nation, the, the need to, or his uh, idea of setting up NGOs, George Soros being one of the ones we, we hear most often uh, during, Re- during the Reagan years. Well, that runs very true. That rings very true with what we heard from another guest on this show. I haven't had him on in a few years now, but John Perkins, uh, author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman, who uh-huh. noted that they put yep. in the NGOs to to replace essentially, so that the so that we wouldn't see the CIA as the operative, but yep. it would be these companies that pose as 
corporate entity. They are corporate entities, or they pose as corporate entities. Go in, they probably have tons of money they can use to bribe and to get people in various nations on their side. They line their pockets. That's exactly what John Perkins talked about. They would offer the dictators yep. whatever they wanted in terms of money or women or whatever, uh, and then and then get their hooks into those countries with a, you know, with uh, some major project development, get them into debt. And then they had then then essentially uh, the power base the, the I think the deep state owned these countries and could do it with them what they wanted not exactly democracy that's just yeah. uh, the cognitive dissonance you're talking about yeah exactly yeah yeah so um, that, that, you, you know uh, you you, you you mentioned uh, this whole notion of the dollar because to me this is what is really important what's holding what's held the U.S. together I mean I'm old enough to have remembered when we were still on a gold standard, an international gold standard, and that sort of kept the playing field fairly even around the, goal, around the globe. You had to earn your way to wealth. You had to produce something that the rest of the world needed. You couldn't just print money and then use it to uh, finance your military and go around and, and beat up countries that didn't obey and didn't do what you wanted. You couldn't just use dollars to buy cheap goods from China or whatever. You would have had to actually produce things yourself to earn the currency, to earn the gold currency so that you could go out and buy other things. But when we went off the gold standard in 1971, when Nixon took us off, that was a big step, wasn't it? And I would like your comments um, perhaps on what's going on in China now and Russia, because you've talked about the One Belt, One Road uh, frequently on this show. We certainly have seen now China, some very interesting things taking place in the oil markets and in the gold markets. It's my understanding now that the uh, petrol yuan has gone live and that the first, I think the first contract is coming up in September, something like that, when when the people mm-hmm. that have sold uh, have sold their oil to China for yuan, not for dollars, are going to be able to get their yuan back, or perhaps take that yuan and, and hedge it into uh, into the gold market through the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So we have these these institutions that have been put in place. You have mentioned also the financial institutions that have been put in place uh, that allow this um, uh, this one belt one road major huge uh, block of, of population to get uh, to, to to become uh, one together in a trading in a trading regime with uh, Russia, China, a lot of the populous countries of, of, of Asia, right? Yes. Well, the, uh, the Belt Road Initiative, as it's now called, the uh, economic Silk Road, is potentially a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure project. The road part is high-speed railway links connecting the east coast of China with uh, all the way up to Mongolia in one spur through Russia uh, to parts of Eastern Europe and on, on to Germany, even the German port, mm-hmm. uh, down through Iran, Istanbul and Turkey and uh, up through Moscow. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge thing. And for the first time in history, it begins to network in terms of trade flows all of the countries in Central Asia together with China and Russia and potentially Western Europe if they get their head turned around right. Uh, right now they're trying to oppose the Silk Road out of very narrow, short-minded thinking because they see it as, as a competition. They see that China will stand as an equal to them. Well, why shouldn't they stand as an equal? You know, mm-hmm. Germany had its industrial revolution in 18, after 1871, Britain had it in the 1700s. America had it after the Civil War. Uh, you know, why should China be forbidden to develop its economy the, the way the Chinese model sees fit to develop it? Mm-hmm. So uh, this is not only a game changer, I call it the game changer in terms of the global economy. What you have on the western side of the ledger, western uh, meaning everything, past Ukraine going toward Europe and, and across the Atlantic, are countries that can do nothing but wage wars everywhere, bombing Syria, France, uh, Britain, and the United States, bombing Syria before any proof of, of chemical uh, weapon use has, has been verified independently. Uh, why why, why the, the mad rush to, to bomb? And the, yeah. Why not wait until the verdict is in? So this, this is the 
kind of hysteria of a, you know, every empire in world history, and, and in a sense, the construct around the dollar. We Americans don't like to think of us as an empire, but de facto it's an informal empire built around the dollar system, built around the rating agencies of Wall Street, uh, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, Fitch, built around the banks of Wall Street, around the U.S. Treasury, with its lunatic sanctions on everything that moves in the world today, it seems. Uh, and, you know, the totality of that is is one uh, well-oiled machine to uh, simply dominate dominate the world. Well, that is collapsing right now. It's a multipolar world that's emerging, and I think that's the best thing that could happen to America. Mm -hmm. You know, all that the Wall Street interests of Goldman Sachs and so in the administration, every administration, it's not, it's Clinton, it's uh, yeah. George W. Bush, it's uh, Obama, it's now Trump, Mnuchin, all these guys. So yeah. this is kind of a, a permanent Wall Street presence controlling American uh, uh, government policy, and that is not to the interest of the United States of America or its citizens, as, as William, you can see. Uh, yeah, ask, ask well, yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah, William, uh, we're just just about out of time, but uh, the whole thing, I, the idea, I think what you're hitting on is what would be good for the American people, not necessarily for the deep state or the, uh, the guys that are really calling the shots and, and taking us to war. The, the perpetual war machine yeah. that, that Eisenhower warned us about is very much in play, it seems to me. You know, they were they, uh, they were pushing Trump to try to go after Syria big time. I mean, if uh, Bolton had his way, we would have been raining uh, bombs on Russia, on Moscow, perhaps. But in any event, uh, with just a couple of minutes left, uh, and it, maybe you can take a minute to answer this. Uh, Germany, you're, you're, you, you live in Germany. Germany did not, nor, yeah. did, a t nor did Italy, back the United States uh, and, uh, and France and England in, in bombing Syria this time. Uh, what do you make of that? Does Germany yeah. have some economic interests that they don't want to? I mean, for example, I believe they would like to see a pipeline built from Russia down into Germany. Isn't that right? And do you think that's sort of the, some cracks that are starting to appear in the Western, uh, in the NATO alliance, economically driven? Most definitely. Most definitely, Jay. The, uh, there's not only the Nord Stream 2 pipeline going from the areas south of St. Petersburg to northern Germany through the uh, Baltic Sea. But the I can tell you, when it comes to the potential of German soldiers facing off against even the risk of that against Russian, Russian soldiers, whether it be in Syria or wherever, Germany has fought two world wars and, and lost badly on both. Right, right. And uh, Russia was on the other side in both. They want nothing to do with another war against Russia today, and Russia also with Germany. Uh, the countries, I, I don't know, if I, I, I'm often in Russia, and I live in Germany since many years, and I don't know any two countries who are more sympathetic and more disposed to, to cooperate together. Mm -hmm. Russian companies never break their contracts. American yeah. companies do. They, they rip them up and double-cross and whatever. Russian companies during the Cold War, Gazprom, never... Okay, William, we're going to William, we're going to have to leave it go at that. We're out of time, unfortunately. Never enough time with you. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll look to do it again sometime in the future.